Well, thanks, Liam, for sitting down and having a discussion with us today. Thank you, Kurt. It's no, been fun. No better man to have a chat with. Oh, well, you're, <laughs> you're very kind, and uh, I'm appreciating the chance because we've gotten to know each other over the last few years and yeah. find ourselves converging maybe on some interesting themes and mm -hmm. emerging ideas and the role of science in conservation and, and so forth. So I think that's maybe where we'll start is um, stepping back a little bit and asking you as a research ecologist, as a teacher, as a conservationist, how you in general think about this interesting moment we're in. We're in a period where we're revisiting a lot of assumptions and yeah. defining our premises or redefining them in new ways and just in a general sense how you're feeling about that new phase that we find ourselves in. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm a teacher, like a, a professor, and I spend a lot of time in the classroom. So my business is, of course, to um, try and think through some of the new thinking in ecology and conservation biology and present it in a way that's kind of coherent and interesting to my, to my students. So I've, I stay kind of well on top of kind of the new contentious debates in conservation biology. And yet, at the same time, I, I think I'm a fairly traditional biologist. I trained as a zoologist in Dublin, in University College uh, Dublin. And, um, you know, from the perspective of just a traditional biologist, you know, I retain kind of a lot of the traditional instincts in conservation, that we need large areas, that we need to set them aside. We need to be very careful with their protection. And so that still remi remains kind of a guiding principle to me, just basic issues of stewardship. Um, so that's not to say that I'm I kind of completely disinclined against c kind of smart technological way of thinking about uh, things, um, s smart ways of rethinking our approach to age-old questions of conservation. So restoration even, I would think of as relatively new since the term is really only coined in, um, certainly in our lifetime, uh, less. Um, so restoration ecology, where we go into a system and we attempt to rehabilitate uh, a degraded system, even that's a significant departure from, from traditional conservation thinking. Because when maybe you and I, for instance, were thinking about these issues first, it was always, you know, we set aside nature and we creep away from it. But restoration invites us back into the system in a way that I think is actually pretty wholesome. Now, there's other kind of approaches these days to conservation, the subject, of course, of some of the deliberations at our conference over the next couple of days that I am kind of less, I, I find less encouraging. Um, so, um, yeah, I think we, we kind of need to be awfully cautious about, you know, um, like rehabilitating things that are lost to us. At least I don't think that's necessarily our best, um, our best uh, approach to conservation. But it's still early days in that debate, so I don't want to foreclose those sort of possibilities. But, you know, basically I'm, I'm a fairly traditional conservation biologist. You know, when you can, you leave things alone. Mm. Um, and yet you find yourself having been transplanted from your home territory and working in an urban setting. Yeah. And for many people uh, who have their image of ecologists and where they work and what yeah. they do, this is still not fully understood or appreciated. So as an urban ecologist, yeah. how do you, do you still have a place for the wild in even now your urban landscape and urban work? Yeah, you know, I, I love this, these, um, you know, I, I love the sort of questions that urban ecology raises for us. So they're certainly not traditional questions because the foundational gesture of traditional ecology is leaving town. So if you could say, like going back to Thoreau's essay, Walking in the 1870s, I guess, to me that's the foundational gesture of, of ecology, the ecologist getting up and leaving town as quickly as possible. 
It's also true of Darwin as well, and we could say that Darwin was maybe the first ecologist. What was his foundational gesture, you know, hopping aboard the Beagle and sort of traveling around the world? But strangely, you know, Thoreau, of course, is now, from our perspective, maybe more of a suburban ecologist. His wilderness was actually, of course, close to town. And Darwin, and maybe this is less known, you know, most of his thinking, most of the important rumination that went on after his trip abroad was done in Downhouse, very close to um, London. And in fact, a lot of the observations in, um, in uh, Origin of Species and later books were based upon things that he was doing in his backyard, you know, burying seeds, thinking about earthworms, thinking about decomposition. So I think it's probably always been there, this possibility that the urban opens up kind of interesting opportunities for us to extend our traditional approaches to conservation. So I'm now in Chicago, of course. I grew up in, in Dublin, and um, Chicago is odd, right? Because, you know, when I first flew over Chicago and looked down, um, particularly since my main encounter with Chicago before I came here was Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. So when I took the job at DePaul, I thought that this was going to be just horrifying. But flying over Chicago for the first time and I looked down and I see the amount of green space that's available to us in Chicago that um, I'd say within two or three weeks of getting the job that I have now in a, you know an urban university with the label urban ecologist um, I really it was transformative for me I see that there's real possibilities for doing conservation work within hitting distance of my um, of my office downtown in in Chicago mm. um, well it reminds me sometimes I have to remind people in my role as a Leopold scholar that his ecology his most intimate ecology wasn't with the great wild lands of the American West. It was in his yeah. close to home, yeah. somewhat degraded, um, mundane, mm -hmm. some would say, landscape of 1930s Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah, amazing. And that, and yet, it's from that setting where this this unifying concept of a land ethic for him came yeah. together. And now it's one of the frontiers of, of that idea, the yeah. land ethic, that it can also have meaning in urban settings. Yeah. And so you're not just an ecologist, you're a thinker and a deep thinker about, about ethics and, and that supplement and complement your science. Is, there, is it a contradiction to have an urban land ethic? Oh, that's a, it's a really an interesting thing to consider. And so the question of an, of an urban land ethic and I think, to be honest, I, I first heard the term um, from you. So, um, so when you talk about the possibility of a, of a urban land ethic, that's really the first time it kind of provoked kind of a suggestion to me that we could use Leopold for thinking about, you know, really urban situations. Um, so that's kind of that's certainly interesting uh, to me. So of course. Of you know, of course we can. I mean, it, it's, it strikes me, and I, I love this kind of um, reminder that Leopold, like Thoreau, like Darwin, you know, like uh, naturalists that are important to me, Robert Lloyd Prager, a great Irish naturalist, that there's two kind of elements to their life. There's, um, on the one hand, there's where we usually think of them as being out in wild places, bouncing around from Tusaki hillock to Tusaki hillock. But most of these writers, all of these writers, uh, or all of these ecologists are also reflective writers. So this kind of combination of, um, you know, being out in the field and then the enormous labor of reflecting and writing upon it has become pretty important to me. So, and a lot of that reflection, of course, historically for ecologists has been done in the urban setting. So to me, wouldn't it be really interesting to take that ruminative element, which has always been sort of a domestic thing, when we sit down with paper and pen, we do that typically at our desk, in the library, or at home. But to start using that ruminative practice to think about kind of our ethical responsibilities in urban environment brings everything very close together, very proximate. And if you think about it, your, your, your tenure here in Chicago is coincided with the rise of a of movement, a sustainable cities movement yeah. that 
maybe didn't even exist when you first arrived, and so you've and we have all kind of grown in, along with this new sensibility that mm -hmm. it's not sustainability isn't just about agriculture or about yeah. our protected areas where we conserve our biodiversity as best we can, but it applies equally to the most humanized of mm -hmm. our mm -hmm. habitats. So, um, you know, the idea of a sustainable city yeah. must be something that you're encountering daily and directly in, in, yeah. your, in your work with your students. Yeah. Yeah, so like traditionally ecology, of course, has seen urban areas as being the epicenter of the disaster. And we can see that in even in the early writings, and which is not so long ago, of folks writing on natural capital and assessments of ecosystem services, the urban area is a blank zone. You know, so ecologists have tended not to think of think very highly of urban areas, but as well kind of urban theorists, even those people who you would think would be most fond of the urban environment tend to bleak things to say about it as well. Um, Murray Bookchin, the eco-anarchist, social ecologist, um, you know, has, um, speaks about the kind of unbearable filth of the city. You know, he talks about the sick fat of the city. And he, of course, is kind of a great kind of New York urban thinker. So even the people who kind of should like cities, in fact, don't like it at all, um, but that, so that's been transformed. Most of that writing kind of started to fade away kind of in the late 70s, early, early 80s. And for the first time, and this is a historical kind of a seismic shift in our thinking, we're thinking about cities not just as kind of these negative presences, but as being potentially now the epicenter for a kind of a new approach to living, dense human settlement, uh, configured in a way that people in cities have access to productive landscapes as well as you know healthy uh, green landscapes and the idea would be then that you know perhaps there can be some sort of re a reversal of flow you know that um, we can actually start with the sustainability ethic a kind of an urban land ethic which itself then can uh, flow out from the city. So rather than cities always being kind of just like these negative entities, they become kind of the sources of productive ideas for the future. And it's not kind of, I don't think it's an extreme thought because in reality, the whole earth, right, is, is I mean, in some senses is an urban environment in the sense that, you know, even if the physical footprint of the city is not there, we know all about the ghost acreage or the ecological footprint, as we call it these days, extends so much further than that. Chicago alone, if you calculate an uh, ecological footprint for Chicago, um, a conservative estimate would put that at five times the size of the state of Illinois. So Chicago doesn't fit into Illinois. Illinois doesn't fit into the Midwest. And the US doesn't, of course, fit into the, its own physical boundaries. So if you th start unpacking it a little bit, you can start thinking about even those areas that we set aside in wilderness areas are influenced by the decision making often emanating from urban centers. So I'm, you know, I'm not only optimistic that urban ecology and urban sustainability thinking is, you know, important or useful. I now think it is probably the thing ultimately that we're going to be doing, that all ecology will become urban ecology. Hmm. This reminds me of a, a line I sometimes use in my lectures and presentations, and that is, um, I think of something as being sustainable if it creates healthier connections within the whole landscape, from mm -hmm. the most urban to the most wild place we have. And if those connections are not contributing to sustainability of the whole, mm -hmm. And then we find ourselves in trouble. Yeah. And we can't sustain any part of that whole landscape unless we're sustaining the whole thing. Yeah, so yeah. Building those connect, that connectivity and that conscientiousness back into the whole landscape is, and the cities are, have to play a part in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, the, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that I can say it um, better than you've said it there, but I, I would think as well though that, you know, the sort of connectivity that come, has to come into urban spaces it is not, I mean, it's, it's fundamentally about space, about the connectivity of space, but it's also about the connectivity of different ways of 
thinking about our situation. So, you know, there has to be, ecologists deserted the city, right? Starting with Thoreau, start, you know, with Darwin, and now recently are coming back. But many disciplines didn't leave the city. Philosophy, you know, is primarily still an urban, it's kind of urban in its genesis, and it's kind of urban in its sensibility. And there's always been those philosophers that think about the fate of the city. So, you know, when ecologists show up back in the city starting maybe the late 80s, early 90s, they can't do it with the expectation that, you know, folks have now got to step aside because the urban ecologists are here. We're going to solve these problems. You know, there has to be a large degree of respect for the fact that questions about the good life, the philosophical good life, there's a 2,000 year old tradition of asking and answering those questions. So there's a real, um, it's, it's, it, it, it's really profoundly important that urban environmental thinkers start to make those connections between those disciplinary experts that have had this pretty long sustaining interest in those questions as well. And, you know, it sounds pretty obvious, maybe slightly trite, but it turns out to be awfully difficult. You know, we're all in favor of, of interdisciplinary dialogue, but it seems like very few of us know how to do it. Um, and that's something that uh, is, is kind of critically important that we start making those connections and making them in ways that are respectful to those other disciplines. Yeah, and in any case, perhaps they're being forced upon us now. Yeah. We can't avoid this anymore. Mm -hmm. So what you were saying earlier has brought us to the verge of a another theme. Uh, you used the term the urbanized planet or the urbanizing mm -hmm. planet. We are live in an increasingly more humanized world. Um, and the term of art that we are using these days is the Anthropocene yeah. for this. And it sounds like you're pretty you're pretty okay with the emergence of this new term and this new perspective. Are you, uh, do you find yourself uh, welcoming or comfortable with this new frame for our conservation discussions? Yeah, I, 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 I find that the Anthropocene is like a, you know, it's not only a useful term, which brings together several different discussions, but it's also just a, I mean, I think even being relatively objective about it, I think it objectively describes the new situation that we find ourselves in. So as we know, you know, you look back at the stratigraphic record, at the geological record, and you look at those events that mark the transition between the major epochs in the history of life. Um, you know, and those of you who can drop by the Field Museum and go through that wonderful exhibit where you go from room to room witnessing a mass extinction as you make that transition to a new era. I think, you know, when you have that in mind, you know, that the kind of transition to a new era tends to be marked by pivotal change. I think it would be very difficult to argue against the um, sort of changes that we're experiencing through under human influence, primarily marked by issues of climate change that would announce to us that yes, we're in a new era and that you know we need to think about how our tools can be applied to you know, uh, ensuring our survival and the survival of all of those other creatures on Earth that we still share the planet with. We are in a new era. We are, and yet, interestingly, we started the conversation when you saying, really, still in many ways you are, quote, mm -hmm. a traditional conservationist. Yeah. So the, you still have a place for the wild in the Anthropocene? Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, so I would, uh, I would say I still f think of myself as being a fairly traditional biologist, but, and see no contradiction between that and a recognition that we are in these difficult, unusual, unique times. I think our, 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 our business is, is still going to be kind of a, um, you know, a search for the wild and, f and maybe more over like a, um, a recognition of the, of the wild in the Anthropocene. So I'm, you know, by disciplinary training, I'm a soil ecologist. 
And, you know, as a soil ecologist, I am aware that every, um, every footfall of ours falls on terra incognita. You know, most of the most, you know, every, every, every step we take that's not capped over is on a world that we know astonishingly little about. So there's wildness no more than a millimeter, you know, beneath the soil. Um, for instance, for instance, and I think, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that whatever disciplinary expert you have sitting in this chair will be able to tell you about the measure of wildness in those uh, kind of d different ha habitats and different ecosystem compartments that they specialize in. So I don't think we've lost wildness. I think we, we've changed the game a little bit in ways that frighten a lot of us, rightly so, but the wild is still there. You just used the word footfall, which is a great word. Yeah. Um, and it made me think of your project that you've embarked on, your adventure you've embarked on, your 1,000 urban miles yeah. project. Can you ex briefly explain us to us what that, what that is and what you're trying to achieve? Yes. So about a year ago in March, February, March uh, of 2013, I was in the Royal Irish Academy in Dublin the, uh, in their library where they have an archive of my favorite naturalist, um, Robert Lloyd Prager, who was born in the 1860s, 1865. In fact, 100 years to the day that one of my brothers and one of my sisters, uh, Porrick and Claire, were born. Um, but uh, pra Prager was the premier naturalist of, of his uh, era. And going through his papers in the archives, I stumbled upon the fact that um, you know, in order to write one of his most important books, um, a book called Irish Topographical Botany, which came out in 1901, he had set aside enough time so that he could walk a thousand miles a year for each of five, five summers in order to get the data for that book. And as I worked through the archives, it kind of occurred to me that, um, you know, if you really want to get to know a place in the way that Prager ended up knowing Ireland, you know, you need to have a physical engagement with those landscapes. And ecology, you know, has been one of the characteristics of the emerging ecology is that we don't, in fact, engage our body with the world in which we're examining. So ecology, like other disciplines, is becoming more and more a discipline where you set up an experiment or you log into your computer and then you step away or else you digitally kind of look at the, look at the world. Whereas the great naturalists of the 19th, 20th century, before, little after maybe, were those um, men and women whose bodily, who had a bodily, physical engagement in the world. Leopold being the brilliant example. So my idea was that in order to kind of provoke not only for myself but for those colleagues who wanted to join with me that I was going to start walking you know a, a thousand miles a year in order to have a fresh encounter with the world that I was interested in. And since I was um, you know I'm an urban ecologist unlike Prager who was primarily um, sort of a botanist out in the, in the wild countryside, my determination was that um, I was going to do this in an urban direction. So instead of heading out of town, I was going to head into town. And, you know, the methodology is actually extraordinarily simple. We all know how to walk, of course. But, you know, Prager was concerned that, you know, as a botanist or as a naturalist, you don't want to make a beeline for those areas of special interest where you know you're going to find those amazing you know, plants and make those delightful observations. That you have to kind of walk more kind of in the spirit of like a Brownian motion across the landscape. That you can't kind of pick your spot. Um, so he devised like a whole set of um, kind of like micro techniques. Like he would get, he hated the car of course, you know, um, he's a man for the bicycle and of course for walking, because walking for him was the right speed to make observations. But he would board a train, get off at a random station, and then walk sort of 20, 20 miles you know, uh, past several, several stations. 
botanizing as he went. In fact, he had a technique that I loved. So he got really skilled at just picking plants up pretty quickly, pop them in his vasculum, and then he would spend like several hours in the evening sorting them out. His, his colleagues marveled at the way in which he could kind of pick a plant, label it, and have it stored away almost without breaking, breaking a step. So I've been kind of trying some of these things in Chicago, getting on the L, getting off at stops that I have no business getting off at, and then just kind of wandering a neighborhood. Uh, my big thing uh, these days is um, tree mapping. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm interested in trees, interested in kind of, um, you know, big old trees, but also, you know, the sort of trees that um, people kind of in gorilla fashion decide that they're going to slip into the parkway. So my, my, my walks tend to be very kind of inspired by looking at kind of the treescape of, of different different uh, neighborhoods. And I've, I have a lot of colleagues now that have picked up this um, kind of Prager walking, as some of them uh, call it. And most of them have something very, very different in mind. Um, but it's the same sort of guiding spirit. And I'm going to guess that some of the most interesting moments you've had are not just when you find a tree in an unlikely place or see a species you didn't expect, but someone's going to stop you and say, what are you doing? What are you looking at? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I have a, I'm, I'm a conversational kind of guy. Um, and so I, I, I don't know whether it's just like I, I look like I'm ready to have a conversation, <laughs> but people will stop you um, and, you know, you have great discussions. And, of course, because, you know, I've always wanted to be a great birder, but I'm not a great birder. But when people see you out there kind of responding to the environment in a particular way, particularly the birders will stop you and tell you kind of, you know, what's going on or who's been in what tree. Or, uh, so those conversations have been extraordinary, extraordinary. Mm. Love it. Well, you seem to have a, it kind of frees you and up in a way, doesn't it, to, to be out there and to be simply walking through a city that most everybody walks through the city. Yeah. Or any other place, but you're, you're freed up in a sense from, from the expectations of how you're supposed to conduct yeah. scientific work. And there's yeah. a, and the, yeah. the freedom of thinking in a different way about your own place yeah. in the city. Yeah, yeah, and it does, of course, like it, um, you know, a thousand miles is not a huge distance, but it's not nothing, as they say in Ireland. <laughs> and you got to, um, so you got to make a little time for that. And these days we've all got very busy schedules. So, um, you know, just saying that this is kind of part of what I'm doing at the moment does free up a little space. You know, I'm, I'm a, I, I kind of have a um, strong interest in social media stuff. I tweet a lot and, you know, I do these sort of things. But when I'm walking, I set aside all electronic stuff. So any photography I do, I do with my regular camera, not with my phone camera, so that there's no distractions. Um, in the city, you know, when I'm on the train, I normally listen to some music. I don't do that when I'm, I'm kind of out doing the, doing the walking. And that's kind of, it's a small little thing, but it's, it has been kind of transformative for me. Um, just one other thing I would love to say about this is uh, I just want to emphasize this, the importance for me of kind of the notion that we need to be physically engaged in systems and just the way in which kind of the trend in contemporary sciences now in ecology, you know, to extract the body from kind of as an epistemological tool, as if, you know, our senses can be somehow substituted. I think that's something that we need to kind of resist, you know, at least in our, our personal practice. And I, I hope at some point you're going to write up a good reflection on your thousand mile walk and John Muir's 1,000 mile yes, walk yeah, to the Gulf. I know. I hope yeah. this is on your yeah. agenda. <laughs> It isn't, isn't it kind of delightful that a, a, th a thousand miles come, comes up in, um, in several different contexts? It seems to be a nice distance for naturalists to contemplate. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope I get to walk with you someday. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. end up, uh, Liam, with a, a more existential question sure. almost. Um, it's a theme that um, we've been exploring in conversations with so many different people, working in so many different places with so many different interests. Um, but as we look to the future, and we started off talking about about um, 
working in the city and about understanding these new and emerging concepts in conservation and ecology. We're at a time when the way we're thinking about the future is both full of interesting new optimisms mm -hmm. and also of really terrifying realities. Um, and the concept of hope has been on my tongue and on many others, and I know all of us kind of play with the term. And it, it seems like a simple term. Mm -hmm. We all think, oh yeah, I'm hoping. I'm, I'm hope, yeah. But it turns out, at least in my experience, to be much more complex. Mm -hmm. So so it's an open-ended question. What about hope? What are you? First of all, are you hopeful? But even beyond that, how do you think of hope and how we respond to these mm -hmm. emerging realities? Yeah. So on the question of hope, which I find also a really intriguing one, because part of my practice as a teacher is that I don't want us to spring out the hope too quickly. So with our students, I mean, these are depressing classes. When you're teaching environmental science, this is tough stuff that you're, and it's emotionally tough stuff for um, you know, our young uh, charges. And I don't want to leap in, uh, you know, I don't want to leap in too quickly just talking about kind of remediation or talking about kind of, um, you know, being perhaps falsely optimistic. Um, so I, I'm, I am careful, I am careful about uh, that. But, you know, I am hopeful, I am hopeful, and some of that is, I'm just constitutionally hopeful. You know, it's just, you know, it's, it's part of my personality to kind of be, pretty excited about being alive. We don't get to do this for very long, unfortunately. And I like to tell my students that, you know, I hate to tell you this, but someday you'll die. Uh, you know, so we are involved in this impo like existentially impossible task. We get up every morning in the sure knowledge that that doesn't last forever. And yet at the same time, some of us at least are constitutionally hopeful. And to me, that's kind of interesting, that like if we have a clear-sighted knowledge of the impossibility of this continuing forever, and yet at the same time, we get up and we do it time and time again. So that's maybe not, um, not the most useful thought, but one of the things that's been on my mind quite a bit is that, you know, because I kind of like to chit-chat with um, people, and it seems to me that I can make this general observation that, you know, most people w do wake up in the morning kind of hoping that they're loved or that they have a, a capacity for love. And even kind of the person who we think might be kind of living the bleakest life, you know, that possibility of love might be there for them. And like in kind of like less dramatic circumstances, those of us, you know, who try and be good friends, be good, you know, partners, we know that like life, that's, it's an impossible task. You know, it's very difficult to kind of navigate your life with somebody, somebody else. So we're constantly failing. We fail as friends, we fail as husbands, you know, we fail as parents, we fail as sons, daughters, you know, we fail. And yet, at the same time, most of us wake up in the morning with love in our hearts. And to me, like in the bleakest of times, that's still something. That's still something. And, and I don't know, like, I mean, it, it kind of strikes me, and I'm just thinking through this as well, just the way you are, you know. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, what can we do with that sort of hope? You know, what can we do with the fact that even in the direst of times, we're still, many of us, most of us perhaps, you know, still have that little bit of optimism about our capacity as human beings. And in fact, it's not only, it strikes me that that's not only kind of just part of the way we think, it seems to be the most important part of the way we think, for, for a lot of us at least. So I would be hopeful that we can kind of think about that model, the model of friendship, personal friendship, the model of, you know, um, love for, you know, our, our partners, and think about ways 
kind of like Leopold, of extending the circle of love so that it embraces kind of the, the, the land broadly conceived in the way that, that Leopold thought about it. I find that, I find that very f interesting answer, Liam, because you're, what, you're, what I'm hearing you say is hope for you doesn't come out of the expectation that, that you're going to achieve a particular aim or goal within mm -hmm. a set time, but it emerges from your sense of community yeah. and your sense of true. connectedness. Um, regardless of what the consequence might be in the short yeah. run, but it is just part of the way to be in the world. Yeah, yeah. And it may be that it's it's kind of not incidental, the fact that, you know, love, like a lot of the things that we're facing as kind of environmentalists, are ultimately tinged with impossibility. But, you know, that that doesn't that doesn't necessarily deflate and defeat us. That community is something because again, like community for Leopold and community in the most vernacular sense, again, is tinged with impossibility. This is not, this is not, community doesn't just happen. It's worked at. And so the fact that we're still doing that work, that you and I are sitting down as now old friends, you know, that we've maintained that relationship over time, that these things still happen you know, still seem, I mean, give, give, it gives me hope. This is not the post-apocalypse yet, even though part of the apocalypse has already occurred. Well, Liam, I, I'm, 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 I think that's the best way to end this, and we'll just hope that we have a chance to have another conversation. Well, thank you so soon. much, and it's really uh, kind of you to interview me. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you.